everyone, I'm Mary McGuire, your guest host for today's very special edition of Community Forum. It's a very special edition today because we are joined today by a very special guest, a man who has been called a legend in Boston broadcast circles, an icon in Boston radio circles. He is none other than Gary LaPierre, and we are thrilled to have you with us today. Gary, Thank welcome you. to Community Thank Forum. You. A legend in my own mind, if nothing else. <laughs> No, definitely Thank a legend. You. Delighted to be here. Thank well, you. it's wonderful to have you here, and it's a thrill for me because I'm a journalist as well and have done some radio, and my husband actually was a television and radio reporter, and he wanted me to convey to you that he, that he says hello, Give and my uh, regards, please. he wishes he could be here to meet you as well. I'm also a huge fan of WBZ Radio, where you were for 43 years, correct? I was. A long <laughs> time. Brought up a couple of generations there, as a matter of fact. Yes, yes. Started there in the early 60s and bailed out about six years ago. I think we could hardly call Seven it bailing ago. out after 43 years. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you this. How do you account for that incredible longevity and success? Um, we just saw Diane Sawyer stepping down or announcing that she will step down as the anchor of World News Tonight yesterday. We see so much change in broadcasting, and yet you were able to sustain a career on the air for 43 years at WBZ, which is an incredible accomplishment in broadcasting. Uh, you even came back to do some replacement work and had to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and get up years painful. ago. <laughs> it really was. It yeah. really was, yeah. So tell me, how do you I, account for it? I don't think there's a simple explanation beyond... Number one, I'm a homer. I really am. I, uh, I'm like the old Johnny Most of the Boston Celtics. I wanted to stay right in Boston. I had opportunities to go other places, other cities, network, and so on, and, and I would talk to them a little bit, but it would all end up, I want to raise my family here. I'm from Massachusetts. I want to be in Massachusetts. Boston is probably the premier broadcast news market in the country, and, and I mean that literally. People say, well, Washington, D.C., obviously, is where the news is. There's one story in Washington, D.C., and it sits up there under that dome. It's, it's politics and government. That's all it is. In Boston, there is a little bit of everything. You're drawing off all of New England. You're drawing stories from Providence, you're out of Connecticut, out of Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, and so on. Boston is the hub of that, so subsequently, you're going to get a real diverse population, number one, but also variety of stories. And as a newsman, there's no better place. There, there just isn't. I just loved it, wanted to be part of it, and managed to hang on by my fingernails for 43 years. It was, it was a good run. I enjoyed every bit of it. So I'm from Baltimore, but I never worked in broadcasting in Baltimore. Is it fun to work in a city where your parents can listen to you on the air, where your brothers and sisters oh, sure. or your friends oh, you know, sure. can listen to you all the time? Yeah, my first job, I remember, was in Dover, New Hampshire. I was brought up in the Berkshires in western Massachusetts, Greenfield, Mass. And I remember my parents getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning and taking the buckboard or whatever they were driving back then in the early 60s all the way over to Dover, New Hampshire, so they could listen to my first time on the radio Aww. in Dover. So, yeah, yeah, that, that's How all. How great is that? That's, oh, that's, that's neat. It really is. So did your parents continue getting up at, at 3 or 4 well, in the morning to listen to you over the years? Fortunately, I worked at WBZ, which did reach the western part of the state. Most stations in the city would, would not reach out there. So... Uh, yeah, they were able to listen to me, and to this day, my mom is in a nursing home, but still listening in the morning. Uh, not for me anymore, but I, they hear me once in a while. I'm doing some commercials and some voice work, just enough things to keep me off the street. But, well, hey, uh, the tremendous voice lives on for sure. Thank now, you. you started in 1963 or thereabouts at, yes. at WBC, yes. and you for for the the bulk of your time there, obviously, for many years, you anchored the morning drive, which is kind of the A game, obviously, in in radio, correct? Right. Well, I went there actually early '64, took over the morning in the fall of. 66, I think. My gosh, you're testing my memory. <laughs> uh, I was there about a year and a half before I took over the morning as the, as the news anchor, and that's when we were rock and roll. Uh, the Beatles were coming to this country, and everything was really big at that time in 64, and uh, I was on with Carl DeSouze, was the morning name that I think people would still remember around here, if you're over a certain age. Uh, Dave Maynard. I, oh, sure. I was on with Carl yeah. DeSouze for 15 years, Dave Maynard for 10 years, and then we went all news where I became the main feature in the morning because it was news, it was the disc jockeys were gone. And, uh, now, I did I read out. that you actually, you succeeded Morton Dean, is that correct? I did, 
Yes. Okay, who I actually know, and I just actually bumped into him at a party um, a, a couple of years ago, and another, you know, terrific newsman with a wonderful voice. Um, well, he lives on the Cape now. I know he does, yeah. yeah. And um, uh, it, it's interesting because I know he's also doing some voiceover work, and of course he went on to become anchor of World News Tonight, I think, The Weekend Show, right. et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. So I didn't realize that until I had some, done some reading. But you mentioned the Beatles, and of course, as a diehard Beatles fan myself, and I've, I've been lucky enough to see Paul McCartney in concert a few times. You have to tell me, how'd you manage to snag that assignment? Because I read that covering the Beatles, coming to America, was one of your first assignments. It was my first big assignment. How lucky it, is that? that? So tell me about that. It was in uh, April of 64. I'd only been at the station for a month. I went there in March. Uh, and I think it was April, I'm not sure of the date, but uh, it was their first trip to Boston. It was after the Ed Sullivan Show, their first big premiere in this country. Wow and their first trip to Boston, and they were to perform at the Boston, the old Boston Garden. And uh, they said, LaPierre, we're going to send you out to cover them when they arrive. They arrived at Hanscom Field in Bedford, Massachusetts. No kidding. Because, they, the, believe it or not, there was not enough security at Logan Airport to handle the Beatles. Really? They could have presidents come and go from Logan <laughs> Airport, but to handle the Beatles, not enough security. So they flew them into a military base, which was Hanscom Field in Bedford, and they flew in about midnight. And I and I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 other reporters, and a few screaming girls that I think were <laughs> staged uh, for when they came off the plane, sometime after midnight, and then accompanied uh, the limousine ride from Hanscom Field into the city. Did they bring them and in at they, midnight under cover of darkness so that... Yes. Okay. Yeah. And the security of a, of a military installation sure. so nobody could get through the gates. Wow. And uh, there was a lot of screaming anyway. But, uh, <laughs> Anyway, we went into the city. They stayed at the Madison Hotel, which was tied to the Boston Garden, if you go back enough years to remember the wow. old Madison. In fact, it was sure. the Manger Hotel. <laughs> now I'm really dating myself. But the Madison was connected to the Boston Garden, and uh, that's where they were housed, and they could bring them in and out of the garden through tunnels from the hotel to the garden without having to go out in public. Uh, and we just basically camped out there 24-7 for two days, and uh, I was in there in the room where the uh, news conference was. They held a news conference before their first show. I did go in and listen to a little bit of the show, but I want to tell you something. Nobody heard any music that night. They just didn't. The screaming was so unbearable <laughs> that I was standing inside the garden overlooking the, the uh, stage. You couldn't hear any music at all. Really? Isn't that you really interesting? Uh, it's about as frustrating as you can get if you go to a concert now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you go to a concert now, whether it's country western or or rock and roll, nobody sits down. They paid $200 for the seat, but they want to stand up. So everybody's standing up, screaming and hollering. Right, and so on. And you that's can't really see anything. But anyway, uh, got a chance to meet them, got a chance to interview them, wow. uh, spent a little bit of time with them. Not an awful lot of time, but uh, it, was, it was, I didn't realize at the time how big it was. That was going to be my question to you. Did you have a sense of how huge no. the Beatles were going well, to be at that point? Except for shutting down the entire city <laughs> and getting to and from uh, access to them, <laughs> you really wouldn't realize how big it was. And certainly you didn't realize how big it was from a historic standpoint. Because it, we look back now and how many years later was uh, the Boston Pops playing Beatles music, which gave you a little bit of a clue that maybe these people did write some good music, and they <laughs> darn well did. Uh, so no, we didn't really have a, a perspective as to how big this event was, mm -hmm. but we're still talking about it 50 years later, and that'll tell you how big it was. And wow. it, uh, uh, so I certainly put that on my resume as one of my more interesting stories, and going from that to 9-11, I guess. Absolutely. Um, do you have the all-important photo of the Beatles, by the way, of yourself with the Beatles? No, no. So no photo well, of this, John Paul this, There is some news coverage of of the room uh, during the news conference and that sort of thing. You can, if you're really paying attention, you can find my p face back there. But oh, okay. I didn't get a chance to do any one-on-one -on -one with them except uh -huh. as they're walking by and there were no cameras involved. It was strictly radio. And, uh, nice was, guys? Was, yeah, yeah, pretty much nice guys. They were as overwhelmed as the media was in this country. They didn't realize how big they were uh -huh. either, I don't think. Uh, uh, picking them off one by one, Paul McCartney, the best. He was their goodwill ambassador. He wouldn't say anything bad about anybody, and he was real, he was cute, and uh, mm -hmm. everybody loved him, and he's a pretty articulate guy. Ringo, a mediocre drummer, in my opinion. Uh, 
<laughs> not the sharpest blade in the drawer, but, uh, but he could be a pretty funny guy. George, very bright guy, but didn't have anything to say about anything. Once in a while, he'd come out with a good line. Hmm. And John was sort of the sit back and be arrogant, hmm. which is kind of what he did a lot. So that's my take on their personalities, wow. if you will. Is that bad? Does that disappoint you in any way? Not at all. I think it's very, yeah. very interesting. But, you know, <laughs> y you mentioned 9-11, and I think one of the, I think the best thing about being a journalist, and I don't know if you agree with this or not, is that you really have a front row seat to history in many cases, whether it's the Beatles or whether it is 9-11. And I yeah. know that you were on the air the morning of 9-11. Right. Um, and I guess my question to you is, Obviously, The Beatles is a memorable story, 9-11 a huge story at the very other end of the spectrum. Um, and my question is, what are the most memorable stories that stick out in your mind in 43 years? Obviously, 9-11 being one, and we'll talk about that, but are there other stories prior to 9-11 that you're just so glad that you had the opportunity to cover? Wow, you could, you could lump a lot of them into one category, and that is presidential politics. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in Chicago, for example, the Democratic Convention, 68, oh, okay. uh, right. when everybody was getting beaten up. Yep, the riots, I, yep. I, I got beat up in Chicago by, first of all, the security police, the gendarmes from Mayor Daley, and from the hippies and yippies and whatnot as well. Because you actually got physically beaten up oh, in Chicago? Oh, yeah, I came back with stitches in my head and the whole thing. Really? So. How many stitches did you have? But that's where the news media is supposed to be. I mean, when, the, when you get two people conflicting and the news media is covering it, covering it the news media gets in between. Now, somebody's going to get hurt. <laughs> you know, and it's, wow. uh, but I, I got knocked down on the convention floor. You remember the old uh, Dan Rather thing from the convention sure, and so I on. Sure, I do. So, so who knocked you down on the convention floor? The security guards. You just really? get in the way, they tell you to get out of the way, and you're interviewing someone, and you're not about to move for anybody, so they just push you aside. Is that you know? when you got the I stitches? I went over, and yeah, yeah. Wow. And I confronted with some people out in, in the park in Chicago, but uh, that's, that was something that I will never forget, but it was my first involvement in presidential politics. I think I was, I don't know, 26 years old. I didn't know from politics, from any, anything, uh, but it was back during the Hubert Humphrey days and so on. It, uh, and I covered every national convention, Republican and Democrat. We really? want to keep it nonpartisan here from 64 <laughs> on. Until, really? What a, a tremendous opportunity uh, that is. So wow. there, were, there were a lot of occasions where, as you said at the beginning of your statement, the great thing about journalism is that you get up every morning or night, whatever your shift <laughs> may be, and you Early are, morning, you are participating case in history. Absolutely. And where else can you do that? If I had to bang out right front fenders for Chevrolets every day of the week, I'd put a, you know, it's, <laughs> it's nuts. But I can go to work every day and it's different every day. Mm -hmm. The challenge the is different every day. The, the challenge to come up with a vocabulary to describe a particular situation mm -hmm. in radio or television or mm -hmm. whatever. You literally are participating and somebody talks about, oh, did you hear what happened about what? And I said, yeah, I was there. And the, what, a, what a kick that is to absolutely. be able to say that. The on-the-job uh, education I every day, it, what you learn every day. That's where my education came from, to be honest with you. I just went to college for one year, and uh, I took a bunch of other courses after that, but never got the degree until I got my doctorate degree. Uh, honorary <laughs> I saw that from doctorate Emerson. degree from Emerson College. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I said to the president of Emerson College at the time, when, I, when they put the I forget what they call it over your shoulders. The hood. And, yeah. the hood, oh, the, what is that called? Yeah, there's a special there's a name, name for it. that. There is. I said, well, Madam President, uh, I guess it's, this is getting your doctorate degree the easy way. She said, Mr. Lapierre, it took you 32 years. That couldn't have been too easy. <laughs> well, plus <laughs> getting up at what? But, at 3 uh, o'clock in yeah, the morning, right? So. But I didn't get it sitting in a classroom. I got it in the street, and I got it covering politics, and I got it covering crime in Boston, covering poverty, covering Beacon Hill, covering... Uh, the Boston you name Marathon, it. you name yeah. it, and yeah. the education that you can get by participating in things that are going to end up in the history books mm -hmm. is something that I will cherish forever. Absolutely. I, I, I wouldn't change any part of what I did for a living. I couldn't agree with you more, and it really, and I think you miss it too, because you're so used to being in the front row seat to history, and, and history isn't unfolding every day, but they're just in the course of 43 years. I mean, so many reporters, when you ask them um, what the most important story they covered is of this generation, they'll say civil rights, and I don't know if that, you know, given your experience at the convention in 68 and, you know, um, civil rights, you know, Voting Act of 1964, all of that, whether that would be one of your top stories that you covered as well or top issues? 
I don't think it's an issue that I would pick out because of the involvement that we had in Boston. I remember you know, the busing days in right. Boston when they started that. Obviously, that was pretty intense stuff. I mean, when you, when the, you were running buses from Charlestown to Roxbury and back and mm -hmm. forth and that sort of stuff, it was, it was pretty intense. And there was, there was an awful lot of history being made there as well that we probably didn't realize at the time. Uh, Judge Garrity, was that his name? Oh, that sound yeah. right? I wasn't that, in Boston at the time. That ordered the, Boston, uh, the yeah. Bo Boston busing. But I don't know as I would pick civil rights out as being number one. I'm not downplaying its importance. I'm just talking about my involvement in it. Right. Uh, so that it wouldn't be necessarily. But I think the presidential politics in general, uh, the first president that I ever interviewed was Lyndon Johnson. Wow. And, and the last one was George W. Bush. So let me and ask you so about this, because I, I think I read you inter you've interviewed six presidents. Is that correct uh, or more? Is it more? It's, I, Probably more. You're going to make me count them up, right? <laughs> no, uh, don't count. Well, so tell me about Lyndon <laughs> Johnson, six. because he's a larger-than-life character, certainly. So tell he me about He certainly him. was. <laughs> Bizarre way that I met Lyndon Johnson. It was not a, a planned assignment. He was speaking at Brown University. And you're a little bit familiar with that part of the country. Yeah, my alma mater, yeah. And uh, is it your alma mater? Yes, it is. Oh, terrific. <laughs> I was sent down to cover his speech. Uh, this was after the assassination, obviously. And, uh, and I was sent there to cover his speech. And I got there a couple of hours early. I was still a young rookie reporter. Set up in the area that had been set up for the media. And I was, there were still about 45 minutes to an hour away from the president actually speaking. Well, I was looking for a restroom. So I went, I didn't know exactly where to go in, in this auditorium. Reporter's dilemma. Always looking the for a restroom Reporter's dilemma, food, right, yeah. exactly. But anyway, I found my way around the back of the stage somewhere where there were restrooms, and I went in there, and as I walked out, I forgot whether I went left or right to get back to my seat, and all of a sudden, these two gorillas grabbed a hold of me and said, where are you going? And I said, uh, I got credentials, I'm going secret back to... Secret Service? Or? Yeah, Secret Service. I said, I'm going back to my seat, but I, I'm a little lost. I don't know exactly where it is. With that, a door right next to us opens up, and Lyndon's head comes out, and he says, what's going on out there? Wow. That's <laughs> and amazing. And the two guys who had me by the throat said, everything's okay, Mr. President, don't worry about it. And he said, who are you with? And I said, uh, I'm with uh, Westinghouse Broadcasting. That was before we became CBS. Okay. This is 66, I think. And I said, I'm with the Westinghouse Broadcasting. Oh, yeah, I know your guy at the Washington Bureau. Uh, and he named his name, and I said, yes, that's correct, Mr. President. He said, Come on in here, I want to talk to you. And these two guys looked at him and they looked at me. Okay, so they pushed me in the door and he was just sitting in there waiting to go on to speak for the next 45 minutes. And he was in there alone in this little room in the backstage area. And we just sat there and shot the breeze. Wow, what Never a lucky recorded a word of it. you were. Really? Never recorded a word. <laughs> That's so how good a reporter I was. I forgot <laughs> to turn on the tape recorder. But we just sat there and shot the breeze. And he knew a lot of guys that and girls that I knew that were in the business and talked about Washington, D.C., talked about Texas, and uh, it was just a casual conversation, and it was, it was fascinating. I walked in and I said, Gary, where the heck have you been? And I said, well, I've been talking to the president. <laughs> yeah, right. Just sit down and shut up. <laughs> That's right. Don't yeah. mind me talking to the president. Yeah. Yeah. So did you have a sense in that conversation of his brilliance and what a tremendous legislator he was, that type of thing, or were you just talking I about more casual I probably didn't things? know the history book as well as I should have at that time, but that, again, was part of my education process. But, yeah, it was pretty clear that this guy had been around the track a few times, and uh, he knew how to handle people. He had me read inside and out as soon as I stepped in the door. And uh, he was a fascinating character. I mean, he did everything except show me his scar from his appendix, or <laughs> the operation that he had. That would have been it next. Did. You talked for that 45 minutes. <laughs> if you'd gone an hour, you would have seen the scar. Yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, but fascinating character. I, uh, the only one that I would put as better, more personable, was, was Ronald Reagan. I've interviewed Ronald Reagan twice and absolutely blown away by this guy. And really? I had a chance to sit alone in a hotel room in Boston with him. Uh, uh, at the uh, Prudential Center and just, again, shooting the breeze. And this guy, you walked into the room and you were just taken away by his, his warmth, his interest in what you had to say, who you were, what you were, mm. and just made you feel so welcome that I walked out of that room and I think I was even a Democrat at the time. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh-oh. Did I give it away? <laughs> I was in my early life. So uh, is he really yeah. the great communicator, or oh, was he, he really the he great is. communicator? I walked out of that room and I said, I will vote for that man no matter what he's running for, whenever. I would have voted for a third term for him uh, because that's how, that's how good he was as a communicator. Huh. And I think that's when I started voting 
Republican. I was just going to ask you that question, <laughs> so you must have read my mind. Is that what turned you, what flipped you? That's interesting. Now, was Nancy Reagan with him? No. He was by himself. No, she was not at the time. Okay. No. Well, he certainly is noted for his warmth and his, you know, personable, you know, nature, I think. Yep. Um, I think that's something oh, he, he has such was. tremendous presence. They, you you know, know, he was an old movie actor and he was a lot of things before he became the President of the United States. And I think all those things went for him. Sometimes they, on certain issues, they go against him. They say, what is, what is this guy? He's a movie actor. Obviously, what does he know? But it, <laughs> uh, uh, I really liked him a lot. He was, uh, he was by far my favorite president. Now, when you talked to him the second time, did he remember you from the first time? I honestly don't remember. Huh, that's I interesting. I don't remember if, if that ever came up. Yeah, but, well, uh, you, I mean, probably. obviously, the president is probably meeting thousands yeah, of people literally sure on are. any given day. They sure are. Um, and I've, I've actually interviewed a couple of presidents, and I have uh, had a conversation with President Clinton and found that he was very much that way, that he has sort of a laser focus on mm -hmm. you, yep. um, and he communicates a lot of warmth and really holds eye contact. You feel like you're the only person in the room, yep. and I don't know if you've interviewed him as well. I have, just one time at the station uh, at uh, WBZ. Uh, he was in the station. I got him into a studio for, you know, your allotted eight minutes and 37 seconds and then get out. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, he was, he was very personable. He was a little bit aloof. I mean, he was pretty busy at the time, and it was doing those quick hits here and there. Yeah. And, uh, so he didn't really knock me out one way or the other, but except that you're sitting there, this little kid from Shelburne Falls, Massachusetts, <laughs> I'm sitting there talking to the President of the United States. Does it get any better than this? Whether you love him or hate him, it really doesn't matter. That's, yeah. that's a career that people would die for. You know, you touch on something that's really so intangible, but it's so key, I think, to the heart of being a journalist. And I went to the Medill School at Northwestern, and I had a, uh, a professor there who was terrific, uh, Vernon Thompson, I think his name was. And he said to us at one point in class, he said, as a journalist, you're able to dance in circles in which you never would have been able to dance. And I think that's so That's a good true, way to put it, sure, you know? yeah. Um, you sort of sit there and you pinch yourself and you say, you know, here I am a boy from Shelburne Falls and here I am sitting here yeah. with Lyndon Johnson, you know, talking off the cuff yeah. or, you know, that type of thing. Now, did you interview um, Bush Sr. and Jr. as well? I did, yes, yeah, on a couple of occasions because they, most, a lot of that, a lot of the presidential contact that I had came through New Hampshire because WBZ was very big is coverage, radio coverage in New Hampshire as well. In the first in the nation presidential primary, anybody right. who ever wanted to be the president of this country had to go through New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And so I interviewed an awful lot of would-be presidents, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and they're still out there. Anybody and who jumps out at you as a would-be president who you're sorry didn't make it to the Oval Office? I don't think so. <laughs> No, if I so could think of it, I probably shouldn't mention it anyway. So the best no. one won. What about Hillary? You think Hillary's going to run? Oh, she's running. There's no question she's running. I'm not convinced she'll be the nominee. Oh, interesting. Uh, but, oh, she's positively running. I mean, why not? She's heir apparent, according yeah. to uh, most of the media and, and so on. Yeah, she's positively running. Whether or not she'll be the nominee, I'm not convinced of that. Uh, we shall see. <laughs> Don't put me out there too far. <laughs> so, um, yeah. let's talk about not just 9-11, but how difficult is it? Well, we know it's difficult to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Would you say that that probably is one of the hardest parts of the job, just the alarm clock going off, number yeah, one? Yeah, that's, that's one of the reasons I retired. In fact, I was blessed that uh, uh, five years before I retired, when I was threatening to retire, uh, and it probably had a little bit to do with contracts and so on, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, when I was thinking that. about leaving, I said, Gary, where do you want to leave? You know, you've got it made. You're on the air from, from 5 o'clock in the morning until 9 o'clock in the morning. You're yeah. done for the day. And I said, you know what? I, it, I, I'm just tired of 3 a.m. Yeah. alarm clocks. And you have to go to bed early. After 40 years, you've got to go to bed at a decent hour. You're supposed to. I didn't <laughs> always, but you should. I should have been in bed by 8 o'clock at night. In fact, my partner, Gil Santos, who lives down in this area. He's Another in, great voice. And, and, yeah, he, Gil's got a set of pipes on him, too. Uh, he, he was the same way. and he, He'd get up 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, but he'd go to bed at 6 or 7 o'clock at night. Mm, Every it's night. hard. Yeah, it's hard to do. Well, I didn't do that, and when you were raising kids, you know, you wanted to be part of it. Absolutely. My yeah. wife was a ballet teacher, and uh, she'd go to work at 3 o'clock in the afternoon when I was home. Oh, okay. So she'd get home at 8 o'clock at night, and I'm sitting there trying to <laughs> not to fall asleep in my <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think uh, that was the toughest part was getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning. But uh, I had a good run, and my, I think my goal in life was to say, I'm going out on my terms and mm -hmm. not going to wait until somebody says it's time to go. 
which so. is which is a, a wonderful thing I think and you know but you, you talk about the, the getting up at 3 a.m. and we joke about that and um, you know there's also a lot of pressure and it's also pretty exhausting to be on the the air for a, a four or five hour stint um, and a story like 9-11 which broke at about what 9 20 9 15 in the morning as I recall it was um, just before nine o'clock just before nine o'clock yeah. um, so the pressure of a situation like that and not just 9-11 but probably if you had to call out what the most intense live situation for you would be I would think it would have been 9-11 that word live yes that positively was the most intense live situation that ever was in in 43 years uh, because you think at that point in your career or at least I did that I was pretty much equipped to handle whatever came down the pipe. <laughs> You'd had plenty of experience. Uh, been there, done that. Right. Probably several times. <laughs> and all of a sudden I'm doing the nine o'clock news in the morning and we knew that something had hit a building in New York but we didn't know if it was a small plane or exactly what it was. By the middle of that newscast by 9.05 or whatever it's very clear that it was a big plane and I'm sitting there watching the monitors and then I see the second plane come around the corner and watch it go into the building. And I'll tell you, I don't care how great your vocabulary, when all of a sudden you're trying to regurgitate words that make some sense to describe a situation that the world has never, ever seen before. I've never seen anything like it. Nobody watching or listening has ever heard or seen anything like it. It was an historic event that hopefully will never be repeated. It was the bloodiest, deadliest attack this country has ever or any country has ever suffered in one shot. We're talking, what, 3,000 people yeah. in, uh, just with the planes? Uh, and to say nothing about the aftermath, uh, that was the challenge of a lifetime. And to this day, honest to God, Mayor, I couldn't tell you what I actually said. <laughs> uh, wow. There are some tapes of what was said on the air, and we were obviously getting feeds from our CBS affiliate in New York at the time. And, and other people in the newsroom were making phone calls and try to call their contacts in New York, what is going on. And I was on the air until the first building went down. Uh, that is anchoring, but other reporters participating and mm -hmm. eyewitnesses and so on. That was a challenge. And I'll tell you, I walked out of there dripping wet, just not knowing what it was that we have just experienced other than this country is under attack. I was just trying to describe to thousands and thousands of people what's going on. Mm -hmm. And how do you describe what's going on never having witnessed or seen or even read about anything of this nature? Because well, it's never happened. And that, uh, absolutely. And you know what's interesting? I actually remember listening to you that morning because I was driving my son to preschool. He had to be at preschool at um, 9 a.m. And his preschool teacher, her husband was in New York, actually very close to the towers, was staying in New York. So she was, you know, inwardly panic stricken, but trying to be calm for all these little mm -hmm. four and five year olds. Um, and I actually was doing a shoot that day in Canton with a company, it was a tech company, and a lot of them were planning on flying to Europe that afternoon. And their initial reaction when people realized that this was a, a terrorist attack, most likely, um, was, you know, we're not, they're not going to keep us down. We're going to keep our flights. We're going to fly, you know, and of course, you know, as Nobody we know, was flying yeah, that day. all, all no. travel, air travel was grounded. But, um, you know, I think one of the confusing things is that, as you said, it was unprecedented. Nobody really knew what was happening. And so it's very difficult, as you say, to be on live. And we're not talking about a quick 30 second hit, as, you know, right. those of us who've worked in television do. We're talking about sustained presence on the air, you know, having to try to explain to people. Until we when figure out what did happen. Exactly. And that took hours and then days. Absolutely. We're still trying to figure it out, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when you look back on that day, you said you don't really remember what you said in many ways. What did you have for support? I mean, what were you using for information other than the visuals that you could see? Well, we have TV monitors in the radio studios, and so we had all the networks up, obviously, ABC, CBS, NBC, and CNN, I think, was up at the time. Uh, and the rest of it was just support from the network itself. And we were chewing anything we could get off of CBS radio. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a pretty big news staff at WBZ, which they still do. And uh, the editors, writers, everybody was pressed into service in terms of trying to make contacts, as I said, with, with contacts they may have had in the news business mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, 
Uh, and from there was waiting for official announcements from, uh, from Washington or, or wherever. It just, it, it's, it's a little bit of a scary time with the news media because you want to get this information on, but you also want it to be right. Mm -hmm. And uh, the pressure. I'm afraid that there were probably several instances where information was put out that wasn't necessarily correct. And that has gotten a lot worse over the course of the years, which we can talk about sometime <laughs> if, if you'd like. But I mean, more mistakes were made. You know, the, 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 the school was shooting, for example, in, in Connecticut, you know, where a bunch of children mm, Newtown, were. Newtown, yep. Newtown. The information that was put out of what happened that day was so dead wrong mm. in so many cases. Where this kid came from, that his mother worked at the school was, you know, it just, but that again was where the competition of the news media has changed, where it's less important to be sure that it's correct and more important to get it on first. Right. And that whole thing of you as a journalist know what I'm talking about. We want to get the story on first and we broke this story and then we had it first. That's fine to be able to say that, but you damn well better have it right. And uh, that, I couldn't agree with you it. more because accuracy is at the top of the pyramid when it comes yep. to you know journalism, I think, for sure. Let me ask you about that because we're in this tremendous churn of this 24-7 news cycle. And not are we in this churn, um, I remember when I went to WJR in Providence, and I'm sure you saw the same with, with BZ, although you were always doing long, you know, um, stints on the air. But um, I remember when I went to Channel 10, we were doing, I don't know, maybe a half an hour. Actually, we were doing cut-ins in the morning. We're doing a half an hour at noon. We're doing a half an hour at six. Well, now, of course, as you know, everybody's doing, you know, five hours or six hours. Mm -hmm. And that those are just the, you know, traditional broadcast stations. Then you've got CNN. You've got you know, the, the right. zillion cable stations, but you've also got this tremendous explosion in social media and uh, the Twitterverse, Facebook, et cetera. So one of the things that occurs to me as a journalist is, you know, I love my copy editors. And one of the great things about, you know, being a journalist is that you got a couple of sets of eyes at least in many cases, not in the case of you broadcasting live on 9-11, for well, example. Well, that was pretty but, unusual circumstances. Right. But, you know, you got a couple sets of eyes who are checking for, you know, spelling, <coughs> grammar, right. content, right. accuracy, all of those things. It seems to me that with the keyboard warriors, and I'm not lumping them all together, but that everybody fancies themselves a journalist, either a photojournalist or a journalist today in some sense, not everybody, but, but those who are um, you know, posting online or tweeting. And, and we should all be this, frightened to death about that. Well, because it's way. completely ahead, uncensored. <laughs> it's not, yes, yeah, so why do you say that, that we should be frightened to death? As somebody who has been you know, a seasoned investigative reporter who's interviewed presidents, who's, you know, why should we be frightened about that? Because most of the information is wrong. I mean, I'm talking the vast majority of it. And the parts that aren't wrong, in fact, may be correct. They are someone's opinion as opposed to the facts of the story. And I don't want to date myself by saying you know, I sound like uh, Joe Friday and whatever. <laughs> just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Uh, it scares me to death. The Twitter world uh, uh, scares me to death. The social media world in general scares me to death. Facebooks and all the things that, that go with that the social media and how it has infiltrated the legitimate media where if something happens in your newsroom or my newsroom in today's world within seconds I'll have people sending me tweets sending me emails sending me instant messages whatever uh, I heard that such an, and I heard this and I heard this and we we heard that and you know what the legitimate media is now going with it they're using these things until we can kind of shake out. Well, we're, we can't confirm it, but we're told that seven people were killed in that particular site, though we cannot, cannot confirm it on our station. Well, if you can't confirm it, don't put it on the air. It's wrong. And sure enough, that happened in Connecticut. It happened in a lot of places all over the country. And it's happening on much too regular basis for my liking that... Uh, and, but I, at the same time, I'll back up and say, I understand why it's being done. It's being done because everybody's doing it. And if you sit back and act like the Christian Science Monitor and say, well, we'll we will put it on as soon as we can confirm all of this, you're going to be a day late and a dollar short because you probably won't have a, a week before it's on once you get all your credentials together. So you've got to be willing to go out on the limb. You've got to be able to trust your sources. I mean, I had to trust sources back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s, whatever. And that's what journalism is all about. 
But now, people, you can't trust if somebody sends you a picture. If somebody sends you a selfie, you don't know whether that's a statue beside you right. with the picture. It just You don't know if it's been manipulated it, or if it's an actual photo, yeah. Right, and so much is being manipulated to the point where, as I said at the beginning, of this rambling statement that I'm making <laughs> that, that uh, you just can't filter it out and the media has given up, in my opinion. The media has, I think, I was thinking about writing a book when I first retired and I was, oh, going, you should. And I was going to call it, The Public Has Stolen the Media and Totally Screwed It Up. And I was trying to come up with the right word and maybe that wasn't, isn't the most politically correct word, but I couldn't think of another way to put it. Well, the that's public, interesting. The public literally has taken over. And if I was writing a blog, for example, for a while. I've seen some and, of your blog uh, posts. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I haven't written any lately, and someday I'll come back and explain to you why I stopped doing it. But it's, if anybody can write a blog. Any idiot can sit down and write a blog on any subject that they want. That's what I'm getting at with and, the keyboard warrior thing. And the key, if I write a blog that's on the CBS website in Boston, which is where I posted them, and I also posted them on my own website, uh, I have a little business on the side doing voice work of LaPierre Communicates, if you'd like to make a note of that. It's, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Did you hear that? LaPierre Communicates, everybody. LaPierre Communicates, everybody. communicates <laughs> uh, But if I were to write, a, say, a 250-word blog, and somebody wants to respond to that blog, one person could say one thing, such as, Gary, you're wrong and you're an idiot. And then another person pipes in, another person pipes in, and the next thing you know, my 250 word blog is now a thousand words of people responding to and building on or taking from whatever I said. Uh, I'm not interested in competing for that. It has totally taken over what I said and I'm not, I don't want to play in that sandbox. I really don't. And I realize there's a certain amount of arrogance that comes with that, and I will confess to it, that for 40 years I did a newscast. I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning, I met with my editors, I talked to the editors and the writers, and we discussed all the stories that are available to us. As you know, there are thousands of them. We whittled it down to the, these are the ones that we have room for, these are the stories that we can cover. We would research them, write them, and I'd put them on the air. And I'd put it on the air and say, that's it, and walk out the door and no response. I don't want to get into a debate. And the first time that I heard a TV anchor say in the middle of the story, and by the way, folks, we'd like to know how you feel about this story. That is the last thing that I would say as a news anchor. I would never ask the public how they feel. I, I'm not doing a talk show. <laughs> I'm doing a newscast. Yeah. Remember Walter Cronkite used to say at the end of his newscast, and that's the way it is, July 5th, 19... And you know what? That's the way it was. Mm. Because Walter said so, and it's over. <laughs> he didn't say, I, by the way, folks, what do you think about this? I'd, I'd really like to know how you... Send me a tweet. I don't think so. And well, the I'm, other thing is, we're so lucky to live in... in the U.S. where we have s access mm -hmm. to so many different news channels, you know, so we have right. this incredible, you know, wealth of information that's out there. Like and you said, so, that 24-7 news cycle. Yeah. Oh yeah, the churn is, is unbelievable. Um, but you know, it's interesting, I'm wondering if there's a balance out there. Columbia Journalism School just apparently <laughs> revamped its whole curriculum to incorporate more of the technology and retain the traditional values. One of the th interesting things that I think you just said, you talked about how you had a news meeting and you guys discussed, you know, you go into a news meeting in the morning, you say, okay, we got 10 stories, but we can only do five. What are the most important? You right. know, what are the things, you know, whatever it is. But the point is, again, you have a meeting of the minds, of good minds, mm -hmm. and you have people interacting and making decisions together, and you're filtering these things through more than, that's what I worry about, you know, that you have one person sending out a tweet, can be inaccurate, can be erroneous, can be offensive. It can be a total lie, it can be totally fabricated, it doesn't matter. It's still put out there with the same volume that I have in my blog or your blog or whatever. And so it, it just becomes so clouded that it disturbs me, particularly where the public literally takes over the news media. People will comment at any time on what they think of the media. Uh, do they ever challenge the guy who makes the donuts down the street? <laughs> do they ever challenge the local architect who put up that building and say, you know what, if I was the architect, I would have moved that window over. The 
Nobody does that. But <laughs> everybody's such a great got point. And when people say to me, yeah. you know, Lapierre, I, yes, I, I, I respect what you've done, but I can't stand your radio station. And I'd say, shut it off. <laughs> exactly. That's why that's they right. put an on and off button on the radio. Right. And that sounds so pompous to say that. It's but my true. gosh, what more can you do? Yeah, I, I completely hear what you're I, saying. I don't go into the local donut shop and say, by the way, I'm here to tell you, I hate your donuts. Well, you know what I think is funny, too, that, you know... I should eat less of them. Yeah, yeah, me too. The press goes out and does its job, and yet the press becomes a whipping boy. There are so many people who yep. blame. There are people who go out and they do something, you know, that really is yeah. d does not display good judgment, and then they blame it on the media. And I sit there and I say, wait a minute, you're the one who committed this, you know, questionable right. act. Like, why isn't the media's fault? Uh, you know, that's another... The media doesn't wear any robes by any stretch of the imagination because the media has to do some, some pretty obnoxious things such as you you have a tragedy of some type and there's some idiot there with a microphone is going to walk up and say three people were killed today how does that make you feel well how the hell do you think it makes me feel and they yeah. do it to families they do it uh, i back in the old when newspapers were uh, more prominent than they are today and radio stations as well if there was a fatality somewhere the newspapers would have to find a reporter who would go out and knock on the door of the family of the victim right. and ask could we have a picture of your son who was just my god that's that's nasty stuff yeah and it's one nobody of the should have big to do downsides that. of being a journalist it is you know? it yeah, is absolutely and i can honestly say i never did that well I that's would something refuse. to be proud of I you would, would refuse i would refuse to do it and did you get did you get grief for refusing, or was yeah? I think on a few occasions, like Gary, you got to go talk to that person. Said, you want me to walk up to that woman whose child was just killed and ask her how she feels? I'm not going to do it. Yeah, good for you. I yeah. didn't. I didn't do it. That's probably one of the reasons for your longevity <laughs> that you stuck to your principles, well, which is yeah. that. And I was great with school cancellations. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You got a lot of snow days in I Boston, was, right? I was the self-appointed cancellation king. You were the king of cancellation. You go through yeah, that list. And, and, yes. Yeah, I, I could read that alphabet faster than these six guys you know. I, you know what? And I remember the jokes <laughs> about that on BZ Radio about who can go through this the snow cancellation list the, fastest. The quickest, yeah, yeah, exactly. And so do it all so in alphabetical order. Yeah, that is a talent, actually. actually Speaking of which, sorry, I think I have to. Time, right? I think. Uh, what were you going to say? <laughs> no, go ahead. I'll get back. I think to I have to actually. Uh, take some time to thank our community sponsors um, at this point. So, um, but I don't see, oh, yes I do. Okay, so first of all, we had some delicious bagels and lox and cream cheese this morning, which comes uh, courtesy of Maxie's Delicatessen. And so our crew, including Gary, would like to thank Maxie's at 117 Sharon Street in Stoughton. Thank you, Maxie's. <laughs> Delicious stuff, Maxie's, as always. Thanks so much. And we have a couple of other, uh, a number of other community sponsors we'd like to uh, single out this morning. The American Cancer Society is looking for volunteers to drive cancer patients to and from their treatments. You can call 1-800-ACS-6662, or you can log on to www.cancer.org if you'd like to help. Ilsa Marks Food Pantry and St. Anthony's Free Market, 2 Park Avenue, Stoughton. They also are looking for volunteers. And for more information, you can call Christine Gallagher at 781-341-0611 or 781-341-0549. Meals on Wheels, delivering hot meals to those in need, many of them shut-ins who cannot get out of their homes, doing a tremendous service. If you would like to volunteer for Meals on Wheels and help forge a relationship many times with a senior citizen, you can call and ask for Jessica at 781-344-8882, extension 2. Stoughton Penny Saver Incorporated, our business is advertising your business. So if you want to get a plug in for your business, and Gary, maybe you want to put in a plug for your voiceover work, 27 <laughs> Rose Glen Street in Stoughton, you can call them at 781-344-4833. Community Forum Showtimes, uh, we air on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at 6 p.m., on Mondays at 8 p.m., on Tuesday at 5 p.m., on Comcast Channel 9, and on Verizon Channel 28. Comments and suggestions for us, please contact us at communityforum1 at yahoo.com. Community Forum Showtimes in Easton, where we also broadcast Monday at 9 p.m., Tuesday at 8 a.m., 
Wednesday at 3 p.m. and Saturday at 10 a.m. Once again on Comcast Channel 9, Verizon Channel 22. If you have comments and suggestions, story ideas, people you'd like to see featured here, you can email us at communityforum1 at yahoo.com. The Samaritans, always looking to help people, and if you would like to volunteer your time to this tremendous organization, they're located at 41 West Street on the fourth floor in Boston. At 617-536-2460, they have a 24-hour helpline. If you need help, you can call 877-870-HOPE. That's 877-870-HOPE or 4673. If you're a teenager in need of help, if you need to talk with someone, you can call Samaritans at 800-252-TEEN. That's 1-800-252-8336. Or you can email them or log on to their website at www.samaritanshope.org. The Stoughton Farmer's Market. Hey, it's vegetable season. My, my garden's growing well, actually. And you can come to the First Parish Universalist Church at 790 Washington Street in Stoughton Center for the Farmer's Market on Saturdays from 10 to 2. And this is a nonprofit volunteer-run event. Uh, it runs now through October 25th, rain or shine. And uh, it features produce from Lane Gardens Farm, O'Brien's Bakery, and Fresh Catch Seafood, one of my favorites, and much, much more. You can also enjoy the live music at the Farmer's Market. So come on down this Saturday at 10 a.m. Kids Day 2014, doesn't get any better than that. It's wet, wild, and wonderful coming up this weekend, June 28th from 10 to 2. We're gonna have a carnival and fireworks, and also um, we're gonna have a tremendous weather forecast this weekend, so it's looking good for that wet, wild, and wonderful event. Carnival and fireworks on July 3rd to celebrate Independence Day from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. at Stoughton High School. Uh, also a, a terrific parade on July 4th. You can line up at 1 p.m. at Park and Prospect Streets if you plan to march. The kickoff is at 2 p.m. on July 4th at Park Street to Washington Street to the DPW. That's the route, so not too long a walk. 781-436-0323 is the number to call if you'd like to be involved or participate or you have a float that you want the world to see. You can also log on to StoughtonCommunityEvents.org. And I think that does it for our I can tell you've done this before. <laughs> Just a few times. I'm rusty, though. Just a few times. <laughs> it's been a few uh, years. Uh, you're good. You're good. But, you know, we certainly hope that everybody will participate with our, our community sponsors because they Have do I a mentioned LaPierreCommunicates.com at all? <laughs> yeah, did you guys oh. hear that? LaPierreCommunicates.com. Oh, and again, you know, you can put it, we, we'll get it out there on the air, put it in the penny save or whatever. <laughs> I hope everybody's heard LaPierreCommunicates.com. Uh. Let's talk about that, though. What are you doing now? How much voiceover work are you doing? I'm sure people are clamoring to hear you on the air again. Well, not an awful lot. I, I'm still, I still have a little side deal with WBZ in Boston where I do some of their voice work for public service announcements and introducing traffic reports in the middle of the night <laughs> uh, when they need voices out of the middle of the night. Uh, so I still do that, uh, doing some commercial work. Uh, mainly because in 43 years in the business, I was never allowed to do a single commercial. Everybody else was doing, uh, Dave Maynard was doing commercials and Gil Santos was doing commercials and everybody was making a buck on the side doing commercials, <laughs> but they didn't want the news guy involved in commercials, mainly because it just presents too many opportunities for getting into trouble with how impartial really are you. I mean, if, I, if for example, I was to become the voice of Enron during its day, and yeah. Enron is indicted for everything wrong with America, and I'm the voice of Enron, not good. Conflict so of interest, yeah, too. And exactly. yeah, so possibly. subsequently, I was not allowed to do them. So were you but comfortable with that, as a, obviously, I as a very serious that. newsman? I, I was comfortable with that, yeah. absolutely, and I think it was the right decision, and, and I was compensated for not doing oh. commercials, and it, and it all worked out very nicely. I like that, being compensated for work that you didn't do, yeah, that's they good. actually did that, they actually did that. But, we should uh, all be so lucky. Anyway, <laughs> so when I retired, I said, you know what, uh, these pipes aren't quite dead yet, maybe I can try doing commercials. And I didn't know if I could sell straw hats to Eskimos, you know, and I just, <laughs> I, I really didn't. I felt as though I could sell things with my voice, but I would never had tried to do it. And so I uh, had my brother, God love him, built a, a blog for, a website for me. And uh, before, this was before I started doing the blog, so it's LaPierre Communicates. And uh, uh, I didn't really market it, but I just had to have some place to go if people wanted to use me as a, as a spokesperson. 
And uh, fortunately, I had some good friends in the sales staff at uh, WBZ as well. And Helps so to the, have connections, and right? And so the sales staff goes out and they uh, go to, I don't know, pick a business, uh, Boston Gas Company. And say, listen, uh, Gary Lafayette is now retired and he's allowed to do commercials. Would you like to have him doing your commercials because I can arrange that? And, Oh, so you also Absolutely. have a publicist out there working for you. That's great. <laughs> well, it, it helps the salesperson <laughs> as well if they can offer yeah. offer Gary up. And so, so I have you know half a dozen people that I do commercials for, and uh, I do some narration stuff on the side, but nothing extensive, but just enough to keep me out of my wife's hair and off the street. You so still have such an incredible voice, and you know often you, you hear people oh, they kind. have a little bit of difficulty with their vocal cords as they age. Do you do you drink like a special tea, or I mean, do you have a I secret? I drink. Yes. It's <laughs> <laughs> Drinking helps, yeah. <laughs> it does. No, I don't. I that God knows it was just uh, you know God was good to me along those lines. I, I mean, I, there are people in the business that make me sound like Florence Nightingale, but it, uh, uh, I didn't. Not true. I, most of it you have to be born with. But the right. main thing with a voice, as you know, as you just proved when you were reading those commercial things, you got to know how to use the voice. I don't. There are people out there with big booming voices who couldn't do a commercial if they had to. But if you know how to use the voice, the highs and the lows and everything that goes with it, that's where the key comes in. And so I've been experimenting with that ever since. And, ever uh, take voice lessons or all natural? Well, I, I went to a broadcasting school in Boston, the old Graham Junior College. I okay. don't know if you remember that. I but saw that's that right. in your bio, yeah. yeah that's, okay. that's where I went to school. And so I get a load of this. You remember Johnny Most? You know, oh, sure. When he was the voice of the of Celtics? Of course, yeah. I had him for a speech teacher. What does that tell really? you? Really? <laughs> this guy, could, <laughs> well, he was one of the greatest. A speech so. teacher. He was one of the greatest, but nobody could understand him. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so oh, to have dear. Johnny Most as an articulation teacher, there's something wrong. But anyway, it uh, uh, yeah, the rest of it just was good luck. You always, though, obviously, you're born with a great set of pipes. So did you always know from the time you were a kid that you wanted to be a newscaster, or you wanted to use your voice, or you wanted to be in radio? My grandfather, when he found out where I was going to school, my mom said, this is after I got out of high school. I joined the Marines, and uh, they didn't want me. So I came to school to go to Boston, and, and I remember her telling my grandfather, he's going to a broadcasting school, and he said, the boy's a mute. <laughs> he never talks. <laughs> <laughs> Never says anything, I, and it's true. I was very quiet. I was a musician. Both my parents were musicians, and I was a very quiet guy. And all of a sudden, I'm blabbing over fifty thousand watts for a living, and uh, it's a little contrary to what I was as a kid. But uh, isn't that I've made something? up for it. <laughs> yeah. So from at some point, then you became more outgoing at than you were point. initially. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, I'm afraid so. Funny? Now I'm trying to go back into my shell. Again. Do you miss LaPierre on the loose? Because that, you know, we've talked about yeah. some of the serious stories you covered, but that really gave you yeah. uh, a forum to do some more imaginative, creative things. It did. It, it got me in trouble occasionally, <laughs> but it was just like 60 or 90 seconds a day of my thoughts on a particular subject. Yeah. And uh, it was a nice forum. And uh, getting back to our original conversation about putting it out there and just letting it sit, right. there was no place to retort. There was no equal time, because there isn't any equal time in broadcasting anymore, as you know. Mm -hmm. If I go on the air and say, I think Ronald Reagan was a nice guy, I don't have to offer the Democrats equal time to that. Right. It's just my opinion. Well, that's what I did with the LaPierre and the Loose. I'd put it out there and go home. Nobody could, isn't nobody that great? Could, nobody could react. What a great and maybe feeling. that's why I'm struggling what happens with the blog. I put it out there now, and everybody comments, and I don't <laughs> want to hear about it. You know? <laughs> Say, don't you understand who I think I am? But uh, it's fun. It really is. But the technology, everything has changed about broadcasting to the point where uh, I just kind of sit back and, and marvel at it now because I'm a bit of a dinosaur when it comes to the technical That's part of things. That's what I always say, like, I, you know, that I was on TV when dinosaurs roamed the earth. But, but let me yes. ask you this. What advice, given, given, you know, Twitter, given Facebook, given all of these channels and many of them just rushing to be first without checking facts, et cetera, what advice would you offer to someone like my daughter, who's at the BU School of Communication, the comm school at BU, and who is a, a tremendous writer and a really good researcher and a good interviewer, and she's good technically. She, you know, she's gen, you know, she's 20 years old, so she knows all the tools. But mm -hmm. what advice would you have for someone like her, for young people who, who want to be part of this tremendous profession, but want to do it well and want to try to balance all of these competing interests of speed and being first and being sensational with, with yeah, really delivering a, the news as, as people need to hear it, the facts? 
that, that's a challenge. <laughs> Your question is a challenge, <laughs> and, and I'd stumble to come up with, with the proper answer because I'm a little bit removed from it and in terms of academia now uh, and, the, and the sorts of things that they're teaching. But uh, uh, first of all, being able to do it all. You, you, you can't just say, well, I want to be an announcer. I'm going to be a radio announcer, and fine, if you are, go knock on doors of radio stations and don't bother to go to BU School of Journalism. It's not going to help you. You can go knock on the doors of radio stations, which is what I did, and got a job. Did you? Radio is stations that how you are, started? Radio, yeah, radio stations are begging for people. Did you knock on because, BZ's door? No, I didn't. I was in, I was in Manchester, New Hampshire. Oh, that's right. You said you, okay. Yeah. And what were the call letters? WKBR, but it's not there anymore. Okay. They, were, they went dark. I think my husband my, may have worked there. My He's high Nashua. school collapsed, my college collapsed, <laughs> and my first radio station collapsed. This wasn't They're because of gone. you, was it? <laughs> <laughs> it could, uh, could have been a factor, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I think that, uh, you, first of all, you've got to stay up with the technology of what's there and what isn't in, in today's world, and that's what she'll have to do. But if she wants to particularly be on the performance end of things and be active in interviews and so on, continue with the journalism. The journalism is extremely important. Uh, Political science classes, positively mandatory, uh, but participate in, in, in some of the radio stations, such as WBUR, uh, the NPR type stations. They're always looking for serious journalists who want to attack it in the proper way. Their presentation perhaps is a little tiresome and, and <laughs> long-winded and whatever. It doesn't have any pizzazz to it because you understand the attention span of the public today is minuscule. Shrinking. Shrinking all the time and just get it out there fast. Okay, on to the next story. Uh, but if you work in an operation like that, work in a small town newspaper, which are also d disappearing in big numbers, uh, and that sort of a radio station, NPR type things, that's going to give you the the background that you have, and I think you're going to have to take it from there because well, I, I wanted to be a disc jockey when I started out. What do I know from being a disc jockey? Well, I was a musician. I figured, I'd, why not be a disc jockey? What did you, did you play and, an instrument or sing? Uh, no, I was, I'm a drummer. Oh, okay. Was a drummer and still am to a degree. Fantastic. Oh, so you have a for, band. For my own entertainment. No, I do not have a band, but I do have two sets of uh, rolling electronic drums, and uh, I just play for my own entertainment. Oh. And uh, my two brothers out in the Berkshires have bunch of sets of drums we all play sometimes no three at three at the same time my son's a drummer he's in a jazz ensemble right? yeah it's great it's not so great sometimes when the practices are going on but. no well that's why he's <laughs> got to get the electronic drums I can sit there my wife will be sitting right next to me watching television and I'll be sitting there just smashing these drums and the only person that hears it is through my headset oh so you still play a lot and you play with you jam with your brothers They're electronic drums yes isn't that fantastic yeah. wow well that's a good tip one of the ways that i entertain myself <laughs> that and cooking and you were asking me earlier what you make dinner every night i read i do all the cooking in my house i love to grocery shop your wife is a lot my you favorite, like to grocery my shop too. favorite store in any community is the grocery store Wow. When I go to a new town, I want to see their grocery store. Hey, it better be good. Your wife is a lucky woman, and I have to say, we I've are so lucky. I've been telling her that for years. <laughs> I'm going to tell her that, too, when I meet her. We are so lucky to have had you here with us today. Oh, thank you. It's been such you. a it fascinating my pleasure. conversation. Thank you. It's been our great pleasure, and we love still hearing you on WBZ Radio, thank and congratulations you. because they won uh, a Peabody this year for did. coverage of the Boston bombings. That and, was, uh, you that know, was big. Peabody this, Award is huge. PBD is huge, and I listen every single day. In fact, I rely on WBZ radio, by the way, so especially traffic a, on the threes. I can't believe we've burned <laughs> up an hour here. That, it's been great. Thanks so much. You're very good. Thank you. Thanks to you all for being with us today, and bye-bye.